Hello everyone, and welcome to our final video on metamorphosis, covering part three. Beginning then with a quick recap for part two, we left off with our four main characters, Gregor, Greta, their mother, and their father. And we see that in terms of the plot, Gregor's condition only continues to, to worsen in terms of his physical state, but he's constantly more concerned about his family's financial stability and what they're going to do now that he can't work, which really shows that he is identified right, by this, this need that they have for him. But in the same time, we also see that although his sister begins to care for him, she takes on these responsibilities in a sense with this image of growing more confident in her abilities, right? She's no longer a girl who sleeps most of the day, uh, gets up, gets dressed, plays violin, goes to, to entertainment type things. She, she very much is growing in her role of caretaker. And we see that the part th two ends with this final huge blow up that Gregor's father has at him, right? When he has come out in this midst of being very upset with what they're doing with his room and taking out all of his furniture. And it ends with his father throwing this apple at Gregor, wounding him in the back and just having this, this fruit lodged. In, in him, right? And we see that this sort of causes a, a great physical pain for him, but also an emotional pain, right? As we, we see sort of the, the way that his family continues to ultimately treat him as more bug than human. And then we continue to talk about our four main analytical points for this story. So point of view, that is in the third person limited, these visualizing details, how we constantly get a very realistic image of what's going on and full access to Gregor's thoughts, but also the anxiety and alienation that he experiences, how this helps to continue to dehumanize him, and how we have this undertone in terms of the role of money in the family, and that as Gregor's transformation continues, they become less financially reliant on him. Let's go ahead then and dive into the final part of metamorphosis. Before continuing to watch the video, please do make sure that you have read the final section on your own first. Let's begin then with comprehension. So we're still in the same setting. In terms of setting, this story is very easy to comprehend because it really only takes place in two places. So Gregor's room and then the family home where his room exists. And we also see that a good chunk of time is covered in part three. So Gregor's transformation begins shortly before Christmas, as we're told in the story, so sometime in December, and that we're going to end part three at the very end of March. So we've covered roughly between three to four months of his life. And in terms of characters, we're still focused on those main four, but now we also have the introduction of the charwoman, meaning the cleaning woman, who works for the Samsas, who oddly is really not afraid of Gregor, given the fact that he's a huge giant insect that the family doesn't tell her about beforehand. But we need to note that this doesn't mean that she treats him kindly, right? She, she most of all treats him like what he now looks like, a bug. And then we also have these German lodgers who begin to rent a room from the Samsas because we see that although they are beginning to work, it's, it's not enough to keep up the household that they have. And we see that their financial troubles get worse after the lodgers discover Gregor and use it as a reason or an excuse to not pay for anything that they have used in terms of their stay. Turning then to our first analytical portion, we're continuing to look at point of view and we're going to use point of view to help us in part identify the theme at the end of this video. So we begin to see that we only get Gregor's thoughts and that in this part of the story, we only get that for, for about a good two thirds of it because something detrimental happens to Gregor. And we see his last thought pictured here. He thought of his family with tenderness and love. The decision that he must disappear was one that he held to even more strongly than his sister, if that were possible. 
So here, this comes after a, a long blow up where the German launders have discovered the existence of Gregor because he's been drawn out by the violin playing of his sister, which he greatly loves. And he, he views that as a moment to be able to reconnect with his sister when in fact it, it spells the beginning of the end for him. And so these are the last thoughts that we see. And it's important that we look at them because it helps us to firmly understand that Gregor always places his family and what they need before himself, before his own needs. And this is part of what makes his understanding his metamorphosis so complex, right? He's never really fully able to accept, accept mentally his change in what's happening to him, even though his body is very much willing to accept these changes, right? He becomes more and more bug-like, but he's constantly unable to reconcile what's happened to him because he continually places his family before himself, particularly in terms of his role as their previous financial caregiver. But we finally see that in terms of third person limited narration, our ability to access Gregor's thoughts and his emotions disappear the moment that he dies. So this happens in part three towards the end of the, the short story where he goes into his room after hearing that his sister needs them to, to get rid of him, right? She's sort of leading the charge and saying, Gregor cannot stay because this isn't Gregor anymore. And his father, although reluctant, agrees and his mother just remains silent. And so he goes back into his room and we get these hints or, or foreshadowing that he is dying because he begins to no longer feel this pain that he's constantly been feeling. And we see here that his head sinks to the floor of its own accord, right? So he willingly gives in to death. And from his nostrils came the last faint flicker of his breath. So with Gregor's death, we see the loss of his thoughts and his emotions, obviously. And we then get to see the view of what happens afterwards differently because we no longer get to see what's happening with Gregor's family through his eyes, but we simply see their actions and their speech. And we see that in, in a sense that they get this sort of freedom or their own change and transformation after the death of Gregor, his sister most of all. We see it here in this final quote from the story. And it was like a confirmation of their dreams and excellent intentions that at the end of their journey, their daughter sprang to her feet first and stretched her young body. And so at the end of this story, you should have noticed a shift in tone in terms of what the the narrator is saying, and how he's saying it. There's a ton of light. There's a sh sun shining through in the train. They're going out into the countryside. It's beautiful. It's peaceful. Far from the, the dank tight and depressing setting that we've been in before. So we see that their hope for a new and a better life comes at the cost of Gregor's life. The second thing that we're continuing to analyze then is visualizing details. And the first thing that we notice is we have conflicting emotions in terms of Gregor and his desire to place his family above himself, but also his continuing change into a bug and how this, this changes the way that he accepts his treatment. So here, take a look at the first quote. We see that yet in his own opinion, he was sufficiently compensated for this worsening condition by the fact that toward evening, the living room door was always thrown open. And so the condition that he's talking about here is the end of part two, where his father has essentially gravely wounded him by throwing this apple into his back. And although we see that Gregor is still in great pain, that no one's bothered to remove the apple, by the way. It stays there the whole entirety of part three. It even collects dust. That Gregor is not angry with his father, nor with any of his other family, because he looks at this act of them keeping the living room door open as an act of kindness, right? When really it's not an act of, of kindness, but rather something that they feel obliged to do because of what's happened. And we come to the second quote. Who could find time in this overworked and tired out family to bother about Gregor more than was absolutely needful? 
And this really shines a light into how Gregor views his role in the family. Right? He's pulled himself away. And initially, he's not overly concerned or upset with the fact that his family hasn't been caring for him in the way that they used to at the beginning of his transformation. We see this in particular in his sister and the fact that she no longer really cares what type of food he's eating or if he's really enjoying it. She just throws in food in the morning, sweeps it up in the evening without even bothering to see if he liked it, right? And so we see that there there's this slow ease of their sympathy for him. But Gregor doesn't meet that with annoyance initially, but rather understanding, right? They have their own financial needs to worry about. But this changes when we see the the level of their lack of care get substantially worse and going back to furniture now ironically right in part two it was the taking away of his furniture that caused him to sort of go into this emotional outrage and reconnect to his human side now we see that it's the overabundance of furniture that does something similar gregor hissed loudly with rage because not one of them thought of shutting the door to spare him such a spectacle and so much noise and so, yes, although Gregor hisses here, which is not normal human behavior, but very much true of insects and of animals, we see that it comes from a place of emotional pain. So they're talking essentially about him outside, and it's as if they, they don't care that he could possibly overhear, because remember, they think that he can't understand them. So they view him as completely devoid of any human ability. We see that this annoys Gregor to no end. Continuing to look at visualizing details, we also see this realistic detail continues to show Gregor's metamorphosis, right? We need to always pay attention to how he is changing because the metamorphosis is so central to what's happening here. So here we see this quote, Gregor was so exasperated when she began addressing him again, he ran at her as if to attack her. And so we see that this is happening because the, the cleaning woman or the charwoman constantly calls him dung beetle. And so she goes into his room really just kind of to poke and to prod and to, to look at him, to really view him as an insect. And it's through this exchange that we finally come to understand what type of bug he is, that he is in fact a dung beetle. But also we see that this is a hugely dehumanizing aspect, right? That no one in this story now is going to refer to him as human, right? We even see this in the fact that none of the family members have bothered to tell the charwoman what's going on. So she has no idea or even reason to think of him as human in the first place. We come to the second quote. Only when he happened to pass the food laid out for him did he take a bit of something kept it there for an hour, and usually spat it out again. And so this is a strange quote, and I place it here for us to really realize and recognize that Gregor sort of tries mentally to hold on to certain things that made him human, right, to this process of eating human food. But from his mo body's perspective, right, as a, a dung beetle, now we know, he can't stand the taste of human food. And that makes a lot of sense, because dung beetles right? For those of you who are, are aware of them, they don't eat human food, but rather they eat manure or, or waste. And so we, we clearly see that it makes sense why Gregor has been acting the way he has, but we also see that he's continuing to move far beyond the ability to, to go back to being a human again. And then we come to anxiety and alienation. And this is going to continue to be a huge part of the story and one that's going to lead us to one of our possible themes. And we see here that Gregor isn't the one now who is initiating his alienation, but rather his family. And we see that in the fact that they only crack the door open for him after he's been injured, right? We see that in the visualizing details, but here it shows, right, that it's not that they view him with compassion, but rather they're trying to compensate for, for what they've done, right? And, and not very much so, because this is the extent of their pity for him, right? And we even see his mother, who in part two was one of the only people besides Greta who was trying to treat Gregor as a human, but even she implores her daughter to shut the door, 
We also see further how this alienation involves not just uh, this aspect of him being shut in his room, but how his family continues to treat him. So it says, it had become a habit in the family to push into his room things there was no room for elsewhere. And so as they get in these German lodgers, for example, his room becomes a storage unit, right? And so this impedes greatly his ability to crawl on the walls, the one thing, right, that brings him joy as, as a bug now. But also it really shows how they view him, right? That this isn't Gregor's room because Gregor doesn't live there anymore. So it's fine to just throw in whatever furniture that we want. We also see this, how these lodgers are stuffing themselves. And here I am dying of starvation. And we see that this is true. By the end of part three, Gregor passes away, probably either from just his starvation or a combination of, of that with the wound that he has in his back. And this shows that his sister, the one who took so much pride and care in, in looking after him, no longer really pays attention to what he likes to eat or if he's even eating at all. And in fact, the family pays way more attention to these strangers, these lodgers, than they do to Gregor. Again, pointing to the fact that they alienate him from their family, in a large part because they no longer view him as human. Another aspect of anxiety and alienation that we see is that the family's alienation of Gregor is greatly linked to the fact, right, that we just said they no longer view him as human. And we see this painfully towards the end of part three when Gregor's sister says this, I won't utter my brother's name in the presence of this creature. We must try to get rid of it. And so it's so painful that Greta is the one to suggest this because from the beginning she was the one who showed the most care of him and tried to treat him still as a human being right remember she lays out this milk for him because she remembers that it's his favorite but awfully so we also see no one else really objects to what she's saying right the father kind of does uh for for a moment when he says this if you could understand us then perhaps we might come to some agreement with him. But as it is, right, this idea that perhaps we could reason with him, get him to understand, we want him to go, but he can't hear us because he can't understand us. So this kind of reveals in a sense that his father clings to this idea that maybe Gregor's mind is still intact. But he is so easily swayed by Greta to get rid of Gregor that we really see that he wasn't clinging on too tightly to this idea in the first place. And finally, we see that Gregor's final act in this short story is characterized by alienation. And here, right, his, his own giving in to alienation it says, Yet Gregor had not the slightest intentions of frightening anyone, far less his sister. He could not stop himself from panting with the effort. And so this is when he makes this great attempt to go back into his room, something that takes the very last of his strength and ultimately costs him his life. Now coming to the last part, this role of money, and this is important because we're going to see how this change in Gregor throughout the story initiates this change in his, his family members too, but also how his death at the end of the story leads to the metamorphosis of his sister as well. So starting first with his family, we begin to see that as they branch out to work, that their problems aren't over. Right, that they, they even have to let out a room to make extra money. And so we see that there's still this burden that comes with having to do these everyday ordinary things in life, like providing for yourself. For example, although the mother has become a seamstress and they're making money that way, right, we see that her asthma isn't talked about as much. She still has to slave away at making clothes for strangers. We see that she's constantly sewing at night right after a long day. The, the father's issues, in fact, are, are perhaps the greatest because we see a change in part two to part three that he continues to wear his uniform, but rather than wearing it now out of pride, it, it, it's really become kind of pathetic because he wears it as if he's too lazy or too downtrodden to take it off. Like, it starts to have grease stains on it. It's disgusting. Right? He doesn't care about his appearance. Right? And then finally, we look at his sister who 
perhaps in, in all of the, the family members who are changing, is slowly changing for the better. Because as she takes on this position of a sales girl, she begins to learn shorthand, which is a, a version of taking notes, and French in order to better herself, looking towards the future. And that her main issue then isn't in, in taking care of herself, but rather that she begins to have less pride in taking care of Gregor because she views him as this monstrous insect rather than her brother. And now I want to turn to, to Greta Moore for a moment because we see that at the very end of the story, the death of Gregor, right, his metamorphosis leading to his demise, with that comes the metamorphosis of, of Greta and her hope for a future. And we see this largely in two ways. So one, now that Gregor is dead and gone. They have the ability now to move out of the apartment and rent something smaller, something more affordable. And this was something that they had wanted to do earlier, but felt trapped by, by Gregor being there. Even though Gregor sort of address, addresses this, that you could take me out in a crate, just put some holes in it, which kind of sort of hints to the fact that Gregor wasn't really the, the problem, but more of this this burden, right, in, in certain things that society expects of them to have, that that's secretly the burden, but with Gregor's death becomes a, a sense of freedom for them. But also we see that towards the end of the story, after they no longer have to worry about Gregor, they look more towards themselves. And we see this primarily in the sort of note at the end of the story that now their parents can look to to Greta becoming uh, married, right? This sign, this final transformation that she has gone from a, a girl at the beginning of the story, one who Gregor views as needing his care and his provision, and his protection, to a young woman who is now ready to embark out on life on her own. So now that we've fully analyzed all three parts of metamorphosis, it's time to look at certain themes that we could pick up on. And you could find a plethora of themes. I'm certainly not going to talk about all of them. I'm just going to talk about two that I think are particularly prevalent in the story. And the first has to do with the topic of alienation and isolation. And the theme that we could derive here is the harmful ability of our obligations or our duties to alienate us from others and ourselves. And we see this in the fact that Gregor's metamorphosis separates him physically and emotionally from those around him. Physically, because he's, he's changed drastically, he frightens those around him. He's unable to communicate with those around him. He stays locked in his room a majority of the time. But also emotionally, because he no longer can connect to his family in that way. But also, we see that this doesn't only begin with his metamorphosis, but in fact it begins earlier. Right? This is just a continued extension of the alienation he already felt before. An alienation that begins with his need to, to fulfill this obligation as son to provide for his family. And so because he starts working as this traveling salesman, he has no friends. Right? That even when he's home, he really doesn't communicate with his family members very well or at all. And that although his giving to his family initially was, was taken as something that was kind of him, by the end of that sort of season in life, right before his metamorphosis, it's something that becomes more expected of him. Right? So with this great financial burden and obligation that he feels for his family, we see the beginning of Gregor's alienation, an alienation which is only heightened through his metamorphosis, not created. The second possible theme that we could pick up on revolves around this topic of the struggle of identity. So having to reconcile the mind with the body. And one theme we could derive from that topic is the inability to properly be understood in a world marked by absurdity. So what on earth do I mean? So 
every one of us as human beings, we have this need to be understood by those around us, right? That's why we make the friends that we do. That's why we can sometimes be frustrated with those around us the way that we are, because you don't understand me. We have this need to be understood. And we have this with Gregor as well, right? That in his experience of change with his body, right, he becomes something different on the outside, but his mind continues to see himself, at least in the beginning, as greatly human, and that he struggles with having to reconcile these two things, right? And we see that his, his family also struggles to reconcile these two things, and ultimately, none of them are able to. Right. And that we see, although this change becomes easier to accept mentally, the worse Gregor gets, right? He he never fully accepts it, right? And we that's no more seen than in, in the very end of part three, where he thinks that he can just go out, have a conversation with his sister, and everything will, will be fine, right? Completely disregarding the fact that they can't understand what he's saying because he can no longer speak as a human, right? And not comprehending the fact that he has changed completely on the outside. And that that's changed the way that they view him as well. And I say a world marked by absurdity because we address this from the very beginning of the short story. The change that Gregor experienced is never treated for the trauma and craziness that it is. Gregor himself sort of takes it as, oh, well, this this happens, right? And although his family reacts in, in varied ways towards it, they also never seek to understand where it comes from. They sort of just accept this change as this is the way it is, right? Sort of just how people get sick. That's the way of life, right? Where transforming into a bug is not the way of life, right? And so, of course, in a world that doesn't address these these crazy things, these crazy transformations, right? Of course, it's not going to be possible to, to really reconcile what is going on in my mind and then what's going on in terms of what's, what's happening to me on the outside. And that's something that Gregor continues to struggle with throughout the story. And eventually, by the end, we understand he never really fully comes to, to reconcile himself to his transformation. That is it for our discussion of Metamorphosis. I really hope you enjoyed it. It's one of my favorite short stories and just a ton of themes that we could talk about. Um, yeah, so feel free definitely to dive into your, your own analysis of what those possible themes could be. The very last story we're going to read together is a short one, much shorter than Metamorphosis. I'm going to post a video, just one last video we have as a class together, covering the analysis of the guest, focusing on the theme. So um, although I'm posting it tomorrow, feel free to read at your own pace in terms of getting a short story done and just make sure that you've finished reading the short story by the end of this week and that you've also watched the video by the end of this week. Thanks for watching and I'll see you tomorrow.